Thank you, Mr. Lawrence Lien. Um, he has given us some very interesting information about the, the extent of voluntarism here in Singapore. And I thought very interesting uh, the percentage of people who actually volunteer. You know, you also mentioned a term I know when you talk about the burden of wealth. Some of you sigh. You know? um, in fact, that is one of the issues in the court case. You know, that I'm going through. A family member of the patient told me the money in the family is a curse to all of us, you know, because the money they f they're all fighting in court, you know, and it's very, very sad. You know. But also, as, um, as, as Mr. Lian mentioned, um, all about the pictures of Singapore, it's about living here in Singapore. What is it about living? It's life here, you know. Um, and uh, when he showed a picture of a slide in 1960s, uh, um, Mr. Wisin told that the, um, the vice president told me, ah, the 60s, we were together. Isn't it? We the... How many baby boomers are here, by the way? <laughs> they all boomers. <laughs> the, 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 yes. <laughs> the baby boomers remember a composition by the Beatles, and one, I think it was Paul McCartney, he wrote a song to say that the love you take should be equal to the love you give. You know? So something like that we give. So our next speaker is Professor Sitaram. Uh, it's a very interesting career. He was with the Asian Development Bank, you know, and, and now he's been um, Shanghai to uh, NUS to help us build up a very important institute called the uh, Global Asia Institute. And I think it's very important policy change for the university, and because all the time we were asked to look east, to look west, we're not too sure which direction. And Professor Tan Cho Chuan spoke to some of us that why not we just focus in Asia? If you're good in Asia, that's wonderful. And link up with the Philippines for the matter, the ambassador is here, you know, wonderful. And I thought, so he's a, a big role in that. He's, he's also very involved also in the Institute of Water Policy. So it's, it's about living here, the education, and he has a very, very challenging job. So we welcome Professor Sitaran. I'm going to be talking very informally based on my life experiences. My belief is that, because uh, I'm not very rich, I was born uh, uh, in a very humble family. My father was a school teacher. I learned that to do good to society, money is useful, but it's not necessary, really. As Lawrence very nicely put the three T's, what I learned is from my father is you can share your knowledge, your time, and you can do good to others. That's what my father did uh, when he was a teacher. And doing good really results in tangible benefits. But the tangible benefits are not immediately obvious. And I was talking at the lunchtime table, and I think Lawrence picked it up when I said, we don't really feel grateful for perhaps a Microsoft uh, company colleague who installed Microsoft in your company, which you are getting dividends out of that because you got your business growing well but you might be grateful for a doctor who cured you of an illness, uh, although you have paid his bill, but you feel more grateful because you got much more than what it was the bill's worth for the service you paid for. Education is like that. And I've experienced it from my father's experience uh, that the students who he taught, in fact, some of his students are even professors in the US, they remember him, although they studied under him 30, 40 years ago, and they want to be grateful to him. Sometimes they say a nice word or they introduce somebody to somebody else. All these things are intangible uh, benefits. But the message I want to share with you today is not to uh, talk about the sharing of knowledge, sharing of time, and sharing of wealth, is how do we then bring this passion of doing good? Lawrence very nicely put it. Is it something given inside us? Some have it, some don't have it. Because now I'm being an, as an educator, also spending many of my years as an international uh, expert in development, there are huge challenges in society. So how do we develop this passion for doing good? My own hypothesis, and that's what I'm trying to defend to you, I've developed some models around it, thinking what it means. I first asked this question, what is the purpose of life? Meaning, what is the difference between life and just living? And my wife and I, we have spent some time working with children. We always asked about, in the world we live, we use what we call as buy and sell. We work somewhere, we earn some money, we go to a shop, we buy some things, we pay for that. So it's basically a transactional world where 
it's a buy and sell and in buy and sell somebody makes a profit because someone else gives that profit or you could think of it as a loss if you got bought something for higher price at this time and another time you could buy it at a lower price. So, you think of it and then you go to another customer that is what the worldly life is. But when it comes to giving time, knowledge and wealth, we do not see that buy and sell in action because if it is not a buy and sell transactions, we do not know what is the real benefit that we get when we have to go to give because when you give you get something right. And Lawrence put it as happiness. So, we have actually developed the model of five resources that we all have it is like the five fingers and that happiness if you know how to count it in your bank account it is not unfortunately it is not the material bank account Lawrence used the word spiritual there is a spiritual bank account happiness you feel good. But again that happiness is not enough because we do not know how that materializes in the worldly bank account again. If you have cash in the bank you know you can take it out and use it for something swipe your credit card. But if I have the spiritual happiness I do not know how it will come and help me in my worldly rainy days and things that I need how does it happen I do not know it. I like to humbly submit I found out about that. So, I want to share about that through some life experiences of our own because life turning events actually teach you. I have met now very eminent people one of them I brought to NUS few months ago who actually does not have a bank account highly acclaimed scientist, he's a great scholar, former politician, he actually does not have a bank account, but he travels all around the world, people take care of him, he's not a monk or a saint, he's doing normal work like you and I. So, I asked him how do you do that? He said you should have the courage that people want you and you should be ready to serve the society. So, I'm going to use the model of serve. I was born in India, so we use the Sanskrit language to understand things. So, in Sanskrit serve means seva S E V A. It is used in Japanese and other languages maybe in Chinese or others in Bahasa you may have it is the serve. So, the first letter of serve is S. This goes back about 10 years ago when I was asked to chair very small uh, staff community fund in the Asian Development Bank you know we have people with six digit salaries we had a staff fund where we used to do some charities because we are an international organization we only do charities in Metro Manila. Guess what the total value of that charity budget fundraised every year annual amount $10,000 <laughs> the people raising so much and I said what is there to chair in this to give away the $10,000 because this is personal charity coming from staff giving it is not the ADB's uh, lending because uh, that is in billions of dollars. So, compared to the billions of dollars the $10,000 did not mean anything right. And how did we collect it? We used to have a big lunch or dinner like this and grow with the hat and collect of course, the lunch or dinner costed more than the money that we would collect for that $10,000. So, when I was asked to chair I said I am not going to be begging for money from my friends I mean this is not the way it should happen. So, I should do something different. So, I kept asking this question how do we really bring that? How do we get that leadership into that? So, I found out at that time he passed away now the president of ADB he liked to sing karaoke. So, I went and we discussed we said can we have a music and get together singing where the president will sing and then I would like you to sponsor that event. So, everybody comes as your guest and we can have a nice evening. I convinced him so, he wrote the first check to make that happen and I said all the money that we will donate or whoever wants to give us entry because there is no ticket for it there is no uh, dinner fee or lunch fee for that and we will then raise. And we made a twist we said we do not want a one time cash donation really we were do those days used to collect with a hat just go around the hat and collect. Said we want people to write a check or if possible write the amount from their salary giving you know payroll giving is very powerful. So, you write a small portion in your payroll automatically it gets deducted. Now, it is almost 10 years guess what the money has multiplied 50 times. So, now we have like a half a million dollar of charitable money that is coming out of the staff we celebrate it each time we do not have any more karaoke singing because that leadership that one person sacrificing that amount made that big impact because when the president gave the next vice president said I will match that amount the deputy director general said I will give 50 percent of it Then every staff everybody started giving. So, the first 
S means the leadership leads by example, by a personal sacrifice and showing that, yes, I want this to be championed. Then what happens? It sends a message across society, across the institution. The second life example that I have is uh, my wife and I spent many years in the Philippines and we were very passionate about educating young children and really wanted to instill character because I believe that this passion of giving and good character molding is really the purpose of education. All of us, except a few who are born wealthy or entrepreneurs, went to some school and university. In a way, the university made us into what we are today. I believe that. And I was very fortunate when I studied. I studied all the time on scholarships. But somehow we don't connect to our own alma mater or university, feeling that gratitude to make that university sustain for the subsequent years and generation. We think that, oh, they have to ask me for money, I have to give a check. No, you're not donating to the university. The university or school is rightfully a shareholder in your own career and making. But we don't feel that way, right? Because we don't attach ourselves to the university or so. We don't believe in that mission in that way. We think that, oh, that's a company. I bought my education. Now they want some gift. I already paid more than what I got. We think like that. That mindset has to change. So we thought we will build a school which will be totally free, but it will mold that character in that young children who will become great leaders in society and support. It was a big challenge because we run a school. It costs several thousand dollars to get all of those things. So people thought we will go and collect money. Yes, what we did, we formed a small group of like-minded people. And at our house, my wife and I had a small meeting. And of course, I had one of my colleagues who is also in the Asian Development Bank, who wrote a nice proposal, business plan, what it will cost, how many years of operating budget, what we need, and all of that. But we said we're not going to ask anybody for money. We shared the proposal to everybody. And there was a small kitty there. Everyone is supposed to write a small chit how much they are willing to donate secretly, you know, like a secret ballot. And I had another colleague who was from Citibank, and he was the treasurer of this volunteer activity that we had planned to do. He collated all the chips. Actual budget, we needed about $100,000 at that time. And he collected all of that. He said, I don't think we have this project. <laughs> because we got $1,000, added all of that money. Because everybody thought, you know, the usual prisoner's dilemma. You know, somebody else is giving. Why should I give so much? So all of them were uh, sitting together. Yes, we must do the project. But there was no collective consensus that actually, hey, split the bill. Let's do it. We didn't think like that. Fair enough. So I requested, let's do a second ballot. Once more. Because we shared the, to the people, hey, we only got $1,000. I don't want to point out who said yes or who said less or who said more. But we don't have the project. So I requested, let's do a second ballot. Once again, everybody put, and uh, we got a little bit more money. Then I said, please check all the chips properly. There was one inspiring colleague there who wrote, of course, the second time the amount was about, I think I forgot, my wife might remember, about $6,000 or so we raised. There was one chip which wrote the rest of the amount. There was one inspired individual who connected to the cause, so I was really shaken up. So now I'm bringing to the next letter. When you share the sacrifice and enjoy it, of course you can write a check. But when you want to serve a cause, you need the commitment that you endure to finish the game. So I took a much different responsibility now. So I had to talk to that person because I don't know who wrote the rest of the amount. So I had to very discreetly find out because in public he's not going to share. And then I told him, he said, yeah, I believe you. Because I know you're really committed to the school. I don't want it to fail. So my wife and I committed ourselves. We're going to save every penny out of this project. Because we're not going to spend $100,000 because you're just giving the rest of the amount. We're not going to make it so frugal that it will be the least cost, most efficient. Because we don't want to spend your money. We want to make sure that we run it. So that's what we did. We built that school as a labor of love. So I got, like as Lauren said, talent, time. I got among our colleagues engineers to design, so nothing paid for it. I got among our colleagues to truck and bring the people, so not paid. So all the build items, now it became in kind. So what that endurance makes it, it brings it efficiency. Because when we have cash, today we could have a meal. Of course, the restaurant is hosting it, fantastic. We paid for it. But if you had a home meal, it'll cost you one-tenth amount. We know it. Because we're giving labor of love. We procure the items, we make it. So the same meal can cost you much less. We'll have a different experience. The 
because you share. So that's the experience that we learn that if you want to do big projects, you need committed individuals who are willing you and willing to help you give value added service. The third letter was a test of time that we had. This was in 2005 when I was responsible as one of the officers working with United Nations and the Asian Development Bank was leading that and with WHO to prepare the status of the Millennium Development Goals. And I was responsible for one report on water. So I wrote this report called Asia Water Watch 2015. You know, in 2005, we were estimating, will we really reach the MDG of water? You know, we are very lucky in Singapore. You open the tap, you can drink the water. Whereas in the Philippines, in much of Asia, India, hundreds of millions of people cannot drink water from the taps. In fact, we used to write the word that one in three Asians don't have water. One in two Asians don't have toilets. I was shaken by that statement differently. I said, if really one in three don't have water, you know, they'll die, right? If they cannot drink water for a day. What we mean is they don't have water that government is able to provide, or they don't have water which is reliably available. So we estimated back of the envelope, what would it really cost to provide the service? We did that number crunching, and it was $8 billion every year for 10 years, starting from 2005. If you consistently invest $8 billion every year for 10 years, that is $80 billion without inflation and all of those things, so you'll achieve it. But an institution like ADB was investing $1 billion only. So that means we are making a wish, but there is no game plan. So I felt very disappointed about it. So I asked, can we create visionary program to really double that? No one was able to say, yes, we can do. So we did all the number crunching to show that, yes, this doubling is possible, and it is necessary, and to inspire governments to do more. Now, this is already seven years down the road. Yes, the Asian Development Bank, the president, uh, agreed to announce it, and they doubled, and we had a $10 billion water financing program that was born, which invested for five years. In fact, they exceeded it, so this year, the bank announced to continue that legacy for another 10 years to become a $25 billion water investment. But there was a very interesting success story inside that. This is a story in the capital city of Phnom Penh, where I met the CEO of that company called Exxon Chan. If you have not met him or known about him, I suggest you go and see his story. He wanted to replicate what is happening in Singapore and wanted to create a proper water utility which delivers water supply to all the people in Phnom Penh 24 by 7. It is not about technology. What this individual did, this is what the we I talk about. Literally, for many days, he never went back home from his office. His staff literally slept in the office and sometimes on the road when they were fixing the pipes because he decided to go on a war footing to really fix the leaks and get the pipes fixed because he wanted to change the attitude of the people to serve the water supply in such a short span. And there was a touching story that he narrated to us. In fact, I brought him to the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy to give a lecture. We've written a case study on his work. He really wanted to achieve 100% bills and cost recovery. You know, a lot of poor people, they don't pay the bill. So what happens usually? The guy who goes to collect the bill forgives them for not paying the bill, but actually collects a bribe from them. This is the reality. And so there are a lot of unpaid bills, but actually most of it is because uncollected bills. So he had the system that if anybody, the bill collector, did any mistake, they'll be fired. If they are found cheating or collecting. At the same time, he said that if any of you find any customer who cannot pay, bring them to me. So his staff usually report, I got 98% collection, there are these two guys cannot pay. This, uh, I got 60% here, these people are not paying. So you'll get all those reports. There was this one story where there was an old, uh, old lady who had a grandchild, but the daughter and son are not alive anymore. One was in an accident, lost, another one fell sick and lost. So she was just managing this grandchild and the grand uh, lady, old lady was managing. She couldn't pay the bill. So he heard the story. And his staff 
properly reported it. And what would he have expected? Because he's CEO, he would have waived the bill, right? Given a free bill. But that didn't happen. They didn't know what happened. She comes out, she said, bill paid. So actually, the, the bill collector collected the bill. Then in the board meeting with his colleagues, he shared that he's actually created a small petty cash from his salary to donate to any non-paying customer because he wanted to protect the company to get all the revenues. He didn't want to wait. So anybody who could not pay the bill, it was like his scholarship, you know, so he would just pay that bill and he will, he will make sure that the company is fully collecting the revenue. Three months down the line, he found that he was not getting such reports of unpaid bills. So he became suspicious. How come now suddenly everybody is not reporting these unpaid bills? So he sent his, some of his friends to investigate. He said, what is happening? I, my kitty is there. No one is coming here. What is happening? He thought maybe because CEO is paying, you know, his staff don't want to burden him. You know, he's paying out of his pocket. He's not giving companies money. So they maybe don't want to report him. They're just waving or, you know, uh, not covering up for their mistakes. He found out, inspired by him, every line manager, everyone has created his own kitty to pay for the bills that our people cannot pay. So he created an institutional legacy where all the people started practicing what he was doing. Because he was actually practicing. So the V is that values that you live to be able to demonstrate that you are not just doing it for one time show, you're actually living it constantly. So to me, that's a very touching story. So I now believe that such big missions have to be accomplished with not one or two people. We need hundreds and thousands of people who need to be constantly there because it's a legacy. And that is where we go back to the academic institution. Universities have that major role to play. We want to create that passion of giving, passion of serving the society into the young hearts and minds. And that will then create a generational, an intergenerational impact where we can then bring that larger good to the society. And that's the three learnings that I have. The last A is about action, but now I want to leave it to question and answer. So I'll give it to Prof. Kwan. Thank you very much.